We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We're going to pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 16. And last week what we saw were Paul and Silas in a Philippian prison. And not only in a prison, but in the inner prison, fashioned with their feet in stocks all night. And this moment right here kind of speaks to me. (laughs) Um, Because although I'm not in a physical prison, there's many times in my life and in my days that I find myself in a a spiritual prison, in in a mental prison. And I need to get free of that. And I watch the Apostle Paul in this one, and I see how he responds, and I want that ability to respond. Because if we're all honest with ourselves, there's a a spiritual depression on so many of us. And nobody can see it because we paint the walls with our smiles, but we live behind bars on the inside. There's prisons that will lock you up, ways of thinking, ways of reasoning, ways of fearing. In Paul and Silas's response in their actual prison is to sing praises to God. I want that. <laughs> I want that for our church too, and I want to be able to know how to do it. And I think the book that Paul wrote a little bit later while he was in this prison in Philippi was the church to the, uh, the Philippian letter. And he kind of gives a kind of a hint right there. The reason that he can sing in prison And the reason that Silas can sing in prison is because they have a gospel perspective. And for these men, it didn't matter if they were preaching in a synagogue, if they were preaching by a river, or if they were in a prison. They were determined to proclaim the gospel of Christ in any circumstance. And so later, when Paul was under house arrest in Rome... He wrote the letter to the Philippians, and he says, hey, um, you know, I want you brothers and sisters to know that what happened to me actually served for the advancement of the gospel, and as a result, it became pretty clear to the whole palace guard and everyone else that I was in chains, not in prison, but for Christ, and because of those chains, most of the brothers and sisters became confident all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So what about us? (laughs) I mean... Have you found yourself in a difficult situation just like you didn't feel like praising God in the midst of it? I know I have. And I have personally found that if I take a step back and look at our faithful God, it can actually help me change my perspective even in a prison. Lamentations 3.21 says it like this. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. This is the reason I have hope. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed Because his compassions fell not, ever. (laughs) They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith the soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him and to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Waiting on the Lord, it's hard sometimes. And I wonder if Paul and Silas... I mean, here they are together with Timothy and Luke, and they've established a beachhead of the gospel in Europe in the city of Philippi in Macedonia. But Paul and Silas were arrested and beaten. Now, I don't know about y'all, but after I get arrested and beaten and imprisoned, John's going to engage in a little rage fantasy. (laughs) Nobody else? Your halos are blinding me. (laughs) Let's see how Paul and Silas respond. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received the charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast with stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself. And the reason for that, for you kids, is if you are a Roman guard and your prisoner got out, it wasn't just death, it was a torturous death. So this prison guard was going to take his life. But it says in verse 28, But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. The crazy thing is, is that when these doors are open and the earthquake happens and the prison doors are flung open and everyone's bands are loosed, it seemed that God had made a way for escape, but they stayed. (laughs) Paul and Silas stayed in prison even though they could leave freely. 
And the guard woke up and he was going to kill himself. And Paul says, don't kill yourself. Don't do that. We're all here. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let's pause for just a second because there is a powerful principle that's at work here. And a lot of times what we're looking for is a way out. And many times what God is looking for is a way in. I have so many situations in my life because, because let, me, let me tell you something. Here's the thing about the gospel. The gospel can be preached and lived in prison just as much as it can be lived outside of prison. No matter where I am, no matter what situation I have, I have gotten myself into, the gospel can be preached and, so, and lived. And, and so while I'm trying to escape, God, give me a way out. Maybe God is like, hey, <laughs> I want a way in. I, I want to work through you in this. I want to show my strength in this. Well, how do I let God in? And one of the things, and we'll talk about this uh, during the rest of the sermon, is we kind of got to unblock our hearts <laughs> because we can block our hearts with bitterness. We can block our hearts with regret. We can block our hearts with anger. And you got to open up your heart a little bit today. Lord, I know there's a way you can use me in this, even though I don't want to be here. I know there's a way that you can do it. I know that's, that there's a, a why here, and you're not going to find it with fear, <laughs> You only see dead ends with fear. So let's look how this plays out in the life of the Apostle Paul because he had a gospel perspective. He had been beaten. He had been stripped. He had been imprisoned, and they decide that they're going to let him go. How does it play out? Well, let's pick back up. Verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrate's have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Now, had it been me, it would have been a roadrunner moment, and you would have seen the cloud right there. But not Paul. See, Paul, he actually has gospel in his heart. And Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned. Being Romans, rut row. <laughs> Because Rome had some laws, and the first law of Rome, one of the first laws, is uh, you can't beat a Roman, and you can't beat a Roman in public, and you can't humiliate a Roman in republic, and if you do, the penalty is death. Rome had death for a lot of them. It was like that episode in Parks and Rec with that, y'all remember that episode? <laughs> Late to the tennis, prison, you know, <laughs> undercooked chicken, prison, overcooked chicken, prison. Well, in Rome, it's not prison, it's death. And so the magistrates who had gotten a Roman citizen uncondemned and beaten them, man, they're, they're facing some serious time. And Paul says, hey, look, we're, I'm not going to go away and we're not going to sneak away. What does Paul do? They've beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. In other words, you publicly humiliated me. Now you're publicly going to um, authorize me. And the sergeants told these words to the magistrates, and they feared. I bet they did. <laughs> you know, it is okay for Christians to utilize the laws of society in order to fix an injustice. And they feared. And they heard that they, when they heard that they were Romans, they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart the city. And they, that's Paul and Silas, went out of the prison, entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them. And then departed. So you get the picture. Paul and Silas says, hey, you know, they could have taken it the distance. They could have had the magistrates have a very bad ending to their day, but they were okay with just saying, hey, man, take back what you said and let me go. And so they let them go, and Paul and Silas go on out. Let's pause and marinate in this for a moment, because here's the thing that I have found out. Whether it is prison or whether it is freedom... It doesn't really matter who causes it. It could be a magistrate or it could be an angel. What's happening in my life right now, it could be from God or it could be from Satan. I, sometimes I really don't know what the difference is. What, what, what I know is that whatever happens in our lives, whether it is from God or whether it is from Satan, it passes through his hands. So whether it came from his hand or whether it came from the enemy is not the most consequential thing. The most consequential thing is whether I'm going to partner with God in the moment 
And will I resist it? Will I push it? Will I go with it? And there's so much we can learn in this situation right now. And, you know, we may not know many times in the situations that we're facing, um, you don't really realize the life lessons until later. It's later when you say, oh, that was good for me. When you asked me in March, when I departed from the GBI, in that moment, I knew God was with me, but it sure didn't feel like that. But when I look backwards on this, like, oh, yeah, God was in that, God was in that, this is how he resolved it. But in the moment, in the prison, in the beatings, it's hard to be able to see it. But what I've come to realize is it doesn't matter, even though it, 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 does, it, it could be from him or it could be from the enemy, but whatever happens, whether it's here or whether it's here, it's all passing through God's hand, and he is with me in this moment. And a lot of times, it's later that we see the lessons. Paul and Silas are lying in a dungeon singing praises to God. An earthquake destroy, destroys the prison. And that event led the jailer and his family coming to the faith as a result. Oh, well, God was in that. And, and they joined together with Lydia and her household, and that becomes the first church on the continent of Europe. And later, Paul and Silas are going to depart. Luke actually stays behind to help build the church. And sometimes what God allows to be removed from our lives is just as important as what He allows to bring into our lives. And it brings us to a place where we can learn to appreciate things, things we were complaining about in January, we might be uh, praising in April. And so I've been thinking a little bit about the fact that there are a lot of times in my life that God is teaching me to appreciate something. Here's what I want to ask you. What is God teaching you to appreciate in this moment? What prison are you currently stuck in that needs a perspective shift? And very simple, maybe, maybe worth some reflection. Maybe God is teaching me to appreciate, you know, my livelihood. Like, <laughs> I hear some of y'all complaining about your jobs. Maybe we need a little paradigm shift to remember that jobs are nice things to have. And so <laughs> I, I think God could use it to uh, teach us to appreciate some things. But I, I had this flashback the other day, and it's, I, I had gone to the gym, and my elbow was starting to hurt. And when I had gone to the doctor, he's like, and I'm like, doctor, you know, my elbow's hurting, and I'm thinking it's just because I'm, I'm, I'm lifting too much weight. You know, Doc, I'm using the 55s, right? And the Doc's like, well, I can tell you just by the way you demonstrated it, John, it's not the amount of weight, it's seldom the amount of weight. Usually, it's how you're gripping it. It's the grip that you've got. So the doctor said it like that, but I, I kind of had a spiritual moment with it. And I'm coming for all you control freaks right now. Okay. I, 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 am, I am coming for the people who, when you pray for your kids, you're not really praying for them as much as you're giving God a punch list of what you want to do. I, I, am, I am coming for everybody who had a plan on January 1st, and, and now you're, you can't find your rhythm and you can't find your groove. And this is so powerful, and I'm going to say it in a better way than the doc said it. And, and I heard him say, you could lift more if you loosen your grip. Let, let me give you another thought. You can hold it different. If you hold it differently, you can handle it. And Paul in that prison and getting out of that prison could have held on to resentment and bitterness and anger. He could have held on, but if you hold it differently, <laughs> it's going to advance you in your spiritual walk. He could have held the circumstances of what happened to him differently, and but he had an actual gospel perspective. So here's what I'm noticing. If I, if I take it day by day, hour by hour, sometimes moment by moment, I'm good. I can handle Sunday on Sunday. What I can't handle is Monday on Sunday. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't do it. i got to fix that. I have a grip on something that's behind me, and the same apostle that went through this is going to write a letter a little bit later saying, forgetting those things which are behind Let's go forth to that which is in front of us. And I've got to learn to let go. And why is it so hard to let go? Y'all have heard that expression, let go and let God. And sometimes I express, you know, let go and let God. What does that mean? You know, I, rents do. Well, let go and let God. Well, that doesn't pay the rent. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the electric bills do. Let go and let God. Well, that doesn't pay the electric bill. And, and so that phrase really isn't so much about letting go of your responsibilities, as much as it's about letting go of those things that you have no control over to begin with. 
And Paul didn't have control over how the magistrates reacted to him. He didn't have control over the way the, the jailer interacted with him. But what he could have control over was his perspective and how he responded to things with the gospel. And I don't think it's really about letting go of the responsibilities. It's about releasing the things you never could control to begin with. All God is doing in our lives in this season is showing us how little control we have sometimes. So how does it affect Paul and Silas going forward? They got out of prison. They're letting go of the anger, the bitterness, the resentment. And it says, chapter 17, verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was... You know, last time we saw that phrase with Luke, it applied to Jesus, that when he came to his hometown, as his manner was, he went to synagogue. It is a good pattern. It is a good practice to get into the presence of God. He says, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, for three weeks, he reasoned with them out of the Scripture, opening in the legend that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that it was this Jesus whom I preached unto you as Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and the chief women, not a few. So Paul gets back to work immediately, and it's awesome. And how did he do it? And I would have been consumed with getting even. <laughs> um, I would have been consumed, and I'm just being honest with you, with what had been done to me. And I, I, I'm going to, for the rest of the message, we're going to look at how it is that Paul can, can do this. But I want, to, I want to start out with this phrase. A few years ago, I started hearing this cultural phrase, and I didn't like it back then. And I couldn't really quite articulate what I didn't like about it. But it was uh, the phrase, you know, I, I have to live my truth. I have to speak the truth. And I was just thinking that if the Apostle Paul actually kind of had that attitude, and it kind of sounds kind of somewhat spiritual, right? It kind of sounds like it's got some value to it because, you know, what many times it means is I need to be true to my values and I got to do what I got to do. But the more I think about it, the more seductive that phrase is, and really off course, because this is what John, Jesus said in John chapter 8. He said, the truth shall set you free. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, your truth will set you free. Because what's Paul's truth? Dude was falsely imprisoned. Dude was stripped down. Dude was beaten. And all of it was wrong. That was Paul's truth, but that's your truth doesn't set you free. Your life experience isn't what sets you free. What Jesus says is the truth sets you free. And Jesus was saying the truth not to gangbangers. Jesus was speaking not to pagans. Jesus wasn't speaking to anybody but the Jews who already believed. But there is a difference between belief and truth. You can believe all kinds of things that are not true, including things about yourself and your situation, which you didn't, can, couldn't control to begin with. Many of us have believed in a little entity that used to give money for your teeth that fell out. <laughs> so you see how over time, and then even the entity itself goes from when I was a, I was a quarter a tooth. Then it was, what, five bucks a tooth, ten bucks for some of you? <laughs> you see how our beliefs, and I'm trying to be careful, but you see how our beliefs can change over time. Belief doesn't define what is true. The truth defines what is true. And the truth that Jesus was talking about was the truth that He was the Messiah and the Son of God and that He was God with us. That's the truth that set us free. That's the truth that the Apostle Paul was able to hold on to in prison. And so even when I'm in prison, God is with me. Even in my state of depression, God is with me. Even as I struggle with addiction, God is with me. Even in this sin, God is with me. He has not abandoned me. He is faithful to me, and I was worth the price of His Son. 
That's what the Apostle Paul was able to hold on to. That's what carried him through on the darkest nights. That's what allowed him to experience and go through the pain without engaging in revenge fantasies. And this is what he wrote in the Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. How did Paul do it? And it's a process. In Romans chapter 12, <laughs> he says, look, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I'm begging you. <laughs> I'm earnestly begging you that by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how large your bank account is. I don't care how many followers you have. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought, because here's the bottom line. We are all wicked, depraved sinners, unworthy of the least of God's mercy. And what Romans tells us is, if we can have that problem, that view actually brings the most glory to God. But Paul says, look, for I say to the grace that is given me to every man among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I beseech you, I beseech you to let go of things. And it's really hard to let go, to grip something a little bit differently. What he was telling them is, hey man, there was an old system, my friends who are Jews, because in the Roman church you had Jewish and you had Gentile. And the Jews were still holding on, they were still gripping the way the sacrificial system was in the past. And it was corrupting their faith. And Paul comes and he shows them a better way through Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus did with his own blood. This is how Jesus opened it up on the cross. This is what Jesus did when he kicked open the tomb. Let go in order to be some, you know, and let go of the past in order you can grip onto something that's so much better. In order for something to be sacrificed, though, it has to die. So he says, hey, look, man, offer yourselves a living sacrifice. And what Paul's doing right here is he's giving a didactic kind of a teaching lesson. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then here it is, be not conformed, write that word down, but be transformed, conformed and transformed. Conformed, be not conformed is the way that the world works. And the picture is of something that's just pressing down so that it can print its image on you. It's the media influences. It's the world philosophies that are trying to imprint you and trying with their seductive voices to tell you to live your truth. But Paul says that's not how the Spirit of God works. The Spirit of God works doesn't work from the outside in. The Spirit of God does it this way. It works from the inside out. You have Paul and Silas. They're stuck in prison, and not just in prison, but in the inner prison. And when they're stuck in this tight space, that's the moment they understand you got to give God the greatest praise in the tightest spaces. And this is time for more faith, more hope, more optimism. Your anchor really was has to has to, your anchor really has to grab hold right now because you don't know what's next, and that's where God lives in that mystery. <laughs> is it possible? God is trying right now to get you to unlearn the way the world works so you can see how He works. What does God want me to unlearn? Oh, I can't handle it anymore. Sure you can if you loosen your grip, <laughs> if you change how you're holding on to it. If you, if you believe He is with you no matter what your situation looks like. If you could lift it, you could lift it if you weren't gripping it so light, tightly. <laughs> I, I, and I, Here's what Apostle Paul says. Forget those things that are behind and press those, those things that are ahead. And I think back, and we'll close it out with this, but I think back to when Israel was escaping Egypt, right? Y'all remember how that happened? God sent this man named Moses with a message, and he looks at Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Let my people go. <laughs> Let my people go. And Pharaoh says, go. And then Pharaoh has a change of heart because all of a sudden he had a massive labor shortage. 
And he sends his armies out to go get his labor pool and bring them back. It's a great management labor dispute of all time. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and the people are there trouncing through the desert. They start to yearn for the days of enslavement in Egypt. They start remembering the good times when they were able to eat decent foods instead of having to rely on the manna that was provided to them every day. And so for 40 years, they roamed in the desert. And that just kind of struck me. Because when they said, you know, God is saying, let my people go, but to the people of Israel, he's saying something that's almost just as hard. He's saying, let Pharaoh go. What? <laughs> let, let Pharaoh go. And to us today, it's not let Pharaoh go, but this is what the Lord says to us, you know, be transformed from the inside out. In order to do that, let Pharaoh go. Let go of your old ways of responding and your old ways of thinking and your, your tit for tat. Let go of your, if they hit me, I'm going to hit them back seven times harder. That's, that's crazy thinking. Let go of these things so that when somebody strikes you on the cheek, you can turn the other cheek. If someone asks for a coat and tells you to walk with them a mile, you walk with them two miles. That, that you pray for your enemies. Let go of the old ways of thinking so that you can hold on to something that is so much better because here is the truth. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus, and we do not have to respond according to the patterns of the old life. And when we adopt that attitude and live as new creatures in Christ, prisons will palaces prove <laughs> because Jesus dwelling with me there. What is your situation? What is that thing that has you most oppressed right now? Here's what I need you to do. Transform yourself by the renewing of your mind that God is with you, that God loves you, and that you're a new creature and you don't have to live in misery anymore. You are free. If you'd like to walk with us here at Camp Creek Church as we serve this wonderful Savior, we'll give you that chance as we stand and sing hymn number